Hey, YouTube, we're going to do a little bit of a switcheroo this week. Instead of Sammy ain't seen shit, over there, it's Ian ain't seen shit. Oh, damn. He has not seen Raging Bull, so enjoy our review and enjoy his first time watching this. So let's get started. Sexy Fade. It's also very obvious that, you know, the stylistic parts of it are at the forefront. Obviously, it's 1980. Color films existed. Just to remind you guys out there, for those of you who don't know, color films existed at this time. <laughs> yeah. This is the same year The Empire Strikes Back came out. They had color film. Right. And so the thing is that he wanted, uh, Scorsese wanted to differentiate between the Rocky films yeah. because the Rocky films were huge. Oh, yeah, And man. after that, uh, boxing films became all the rage. And so everybody had boxing films. Rocky II came out, I want to say, the same year. Nine or yeah, the, right before this was in between uh, Rocky two and three, I believe. Right, and then there was a couple other ones that were around. Like, all right, we're gonna yeah. get on this boxing train and sell some boxing uh, movies. And he was like, you know what? I want to make a film, but the problem was that he was trying to recreate the forties and fifties look of the the stadiums and the rings and the gloves, and the film stock wouldn't keep the vibrant colors, and yeah. so everything looked dark. Uh, These are the red gloves, like the burgundy gloves. Let me see if I got a picture. Uh, it was of De Niro right here, where the burgundy gloves, they looked like, you know, that kind of leather red, mm -hmm. but on film, they would look black and they would, it just didn't work. None yeah. of the, none of it worked. And so he was like, you know what? I'm dissatisfied with this. I don't want, you know, to have a product that's not going to be as good as I'd want it to be. Mm -hmm. And another reason why he did that was because he, he, uh, remembered that the people who were watching these fights when they happen uh, some f uh, 40 years prior were on black and white televisions. And so he was thinking, well, you know what? If they remember it as such, why would we try to make it color? They, they, that yeah. association won't happen. And so like, here's like an actual fight with Sugar Ray uh, Robinson and Jake LaMotta. This is actual footage of them fighting. I want I don't know which of the six fights this is, but this is them, you know, going at it. And, this is how people remember it. It creates this kind of timelessness in this early 80s where it might not have seemed so gimmicky. You know, uh, mm -hmm. color film is around for some time, of course, you know, but at the same at the same time, think of something like The Artist that came out, you know, last decade where it's like, oh, this, a layman would be like, this yeah. is gimmicky. Yeah. Why are they trying to do this? There's no sound, really. It's a great film. I'm not saying it's not. It's a fantastic film. Well, and, and I feel like I feel like the, the choice to, to shoot the movie in black and white um, helps a lot in the dramatic scenes to really just kind of like strip away any of like the, the artifice that you would get in the movie, mm -hmm. you know, to kind of like take away any of like the spit polish, you know, the, the pizzazz that you would expect to get in a quote unquote Hollywood biopic, you know, by taking away something as seemingly simple as the color mm -hmm. out of the film, you know, when you have these moments, whether it be the fights or whether it be, you know, the, the arguments that he gets in with him and his wife, you know, stuff with him and his brother. It, it gives it this extra just rawness combined with the energy added from the, the editing and the, and just kind of the overall moodiness of the cinematography and the decision to do it in black and white just like takes away this one other level of like the, the, what you expect to see in a normal movie, right? You know, what you, the, the kind of, uh, um, what's the, the phrase I'm thinking of? I don't know <laughs> the, the expectations you have when you go to see a movie, like what you were talking about earlier, where holding on certain, on certain scenes longer than you should have so that it makes you uncomfortable. You know, like in this, you know, you take away color and it just gives the whole thing this very real visceral look. And again, it helps to put you in that scene. It, it makes this scene feel a lot more real in a weird way, because even though the world isn't black and white, by taking away something, you know, like color, it just sort of sucks you in that much more because not having color in your film, you focus more on the story. You focus more, more on the performances. Right. You don't have the normal razzle dazzle right and in that same kind of vein you have that kind of thing like that you, you get you take away that layer right yeah. but then you add another layer of something that wasn't seen in these movies before and that's putting the, the camera in the ring oh yeah yeah and, definitely and so like rocky it's all shot very broadcast now i haven't seen it but i've seen those fights over and over again uh, i know uh, i know uh, here's the thing but it's one of those ones where i've seen a bunch of chunks and so and i, I get a lot of them confused because i've seen which ones with ivan drago uh four four so i've yeah. seen parts of one Parts of four, parts of Mr. T's one. Three. <laughs> I've seen I've seen chunks seen bits but I, and pieces. Right, yeah. but I haven't yeah, been yeah, able yeah. to make one full Rocky movie. The I've one I seen, have seen, it's great because it's all five of those fighters in one ring. What's up? I was gonna say you've seen Creed though, right? I have seen Creed. Okay. So okay. I have seen Rocky in that inherent sense, okay. I guess. But you know, when he 
you know, we talked about earlier, he hated sports. He doesn't like sports. And Scorsese. Th- Scorsese is yeah. what I'm saying. And Rocky. Fuck, he hated sports now. Uh, no, Scorsese hated sports. So De Niro's like, hey, I got this story about this box. He's like, yeah, fuck off with that. I don't want to deal with that until he got addicted to crack or whatever he was addicted to. Cocaine was it, uh, I want to uh, say? Uh, cocaine, I think for, for a little bit it was heroin. Right. Ooh, the good stuff. Anyway, yeah. we see how that ends up in last week's movie. But um, <laughs> he hated those things, but he said, you know what? If I'm going to do this movie, I'm going to shoot it like it hasn't been shot. And so he described the camera as a third fighter yeah which if you think about it is really weird when you're talking about boxing but if you kind of see how it's shot and you see how things are framed how the a fighter will be coming at you and then go to the other one it it, it is a very apt description of it yeah yeah and it's definitely um uh, the editing is a big part of that but also just little touches he does like there'll be a, a half second shot where Somebody will go to swing a punch, and like the camera will be mount, like it's a GoPro. The camera will be mounted onto their boxing glove as it goes in to hit their face. You know, so you'll get all of these different little, um, different little aspects you're not normally seeing in a boxing fight. Right. You know, the point of impact. You know, blood flying out. You know, sweat. You know, sweat, blood dripping off of the mat. You know, all these little details. That in something like a Rocky, you're not going to see because it's shot like a normal broadcast fight. Right. And the thing about it is that the way he choreographed it is that it's so fluid in the way that it moves. And the thing that's also interesting about the way the cameraman dealt with the scene was that he changed the speed of the camera on the fly mm-hmm. so he went from manual to like or he went from like a manual crank where it was going yeah. and then you go okay let me get uh, up the rpms on this or uh, frames per second yeah. and so you get scenes like this where it would just slow down he'd be all prepared the flashes would go off and then as it ramps up you see that okay it's back to you know full-on fighting action and it wouldn't stop then you get little stylistic shots like this where it's like, oh man, that just looks cool. It's, yeah. it's it's a you know it's the microphone dropping from the ceiling on a black backdrop, which he had the entire surrounding of the audience with black tarps essentially mm-hmm. to keep the fake smoke in, and it creates this weird like dream world of a fight because when you are in a ring, when you are in a fight, I don't know if you've ever been in a fight. I don't. I'm not in many. I don't, have you been in a fight? I'm not. No. Well, I haven't been in many. But tunnel vision is a real thing. Mm. And so when you look at these fights, you're not paying attention to anything in the background. You're yeah. not paying attention to the audience. You may see them on the bottom. You may hear them, mm. but you're not focusing. You focus on the, and that's part of like the taking away the color, the black yeah. and white. That's what I'm focusing on. That's what I'm a part well, of. I was going to say that transition is a really great example of how they kind of use black and white in like a cool stylistic way as a transition because, you know, you're essentially, yeah, you're dealing with black and white. Well, your background's already black. So, you know, you're essentially masking your cut by just panning up. Right, you know? and, and again, it being black and white, it just fo- it, it helps you to kind of focus in and look at just the ring, at just the fight. Right, and it, it's not even just about the fights with this choreography because the fights only consist of about ten minutes of this film. It's yeah. a two-hour movie, yeah. and ten minutes are dedicated to the fights. And he shot these first mm. because he knew how important they would be to kind of relaying the story. But this is not a boxing movie. This is a movie with boxing in it yeah. and about a boxer. And with that, it's it's about the man. And how do you show us a man that, you know, that says and does so many awful things? And it's really just about framing the perspective. In the middle of the film, he goes, you know what? I'm going to put a montage in there. And I'm going to put a montage in there with color. And I didn't even notice it was in color in the beginning because I was just watching it like, okay, no big deal. This is going to be a nice little uh, montage of his fights in the middle. And then the color film comes in and I was like, I don't even notice that it happened. I, I had to be reminded that oh, that's right, the rest of the movie is in black and white, and these little parts are in color, which Scorsese hand-scratched the film on these, and they had to give it to like some like sorry-ass cameraman because the real cameraman framed the images too perfectly, and so like, here, just record. Record them doing stuff because, God damn it, my camera guys are too good. And yeah. so you get these really kind of nicely edited little vignettes of his fights, and then him getting married with his mistress, and then his brother getting married... And it shows that he's a normal person who's loved by his family and he's not an evil guy Mm -hmm. and he doesn't intend to be, you know, he just wants to be champion. He's being sweet with his wife, throwing her in the pool and all this nonsense. And it's when those editing and cinematography moments come in handy. We know he's an insecure man. We know that he complains about it all the time. He's not sure of anything in his life at all, whether it's the title shot, his personal life, his sex life. He's not sure of it. <laughs> Who's fucking his wife? Who's Who and what is fucking his <laughs> wife? How many members of the mob are fucking his wife? <laughs> if it's all of them. And Scorsese makes a point to show why he feels so slighted all the time and why he feels like everyone is against him. And from his perspective, it shows you that he's in the right. And the way that he does this is by slowing things down in Lamada's perspective. And yeah. he does it a lot, but 
when you kind of see things from his uh, viewpoint, let me see if I can skip ahead a little bit because I know that I want to emphasize on one part in particular. Um, when they kind of show it from his eyes, you can see why he thinks those people are bad because he is very much a stickler of details. Yeah. He's a boxer. That's what boxers do. They always re- uh, train. They're repetitious. And mm-hmm. so when he's focusing on these things in slow motion and it cuts back to him, even though he's standing still in regular speed, you can tell, oh, yeah, this is a total feeling of an ease I should be feeling. And it happens again, man. It happens again in his own house yeah. later, you know, later when he does get his title shot. And it's with the goddamn mafia boss. Like, it's the dawn of this whole city and this whole section. And you see it, and it's like, man, at first it's small. At first it's just people kind of being nice with his wife and you think oh man he's crazy this guy's off his rocker he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about but then you start saying okay he's starting to piece things together he's asking questions he didn't hear about certain altercations like he said did you fuck my wife is what it ends up leading to and when he comes the tommy the mom boss comes to invite him say hey you know what good luck i'm in your home just want to say all right we're good i got you the fight you know make me proud Mm -hmm. he starts getting involved with his wife saying, you know what? Hey, don't go say hi to him. Joey gets involved. And then you see everything just kind of snap and you go, Oh, this is really what he's seeing. And I may not agree with it, yeah. but I can see why he's getting so upset. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, say hello to everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. You say goodbye. You say hello. You say goodbye. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you stop that? Huh? Shut up! Stop it! Shut up! Shut up! I'll fucking take care of you later! Shut up! And it's when Joey gets involved in his personal affairs is when he loses his shit. And yeah. you see the kind of anticipation building because you see his brother looking, holding his wife, hand on his wife, hand on the mob boss. Mob boss kisses his wife on the lips because apparently that's an Italian thing. But even then, Joey does it at, uh, with his wife and he's like, I can't kiss my sister-in-law. Like It's a cultural thing, but at the same yeah. time, he, he takes great offense to it. And just in general, this scene is fucking shot amazingly, man. Like You just look at a shot like this where... Oh yeah, there's a visual divide between him and his wife, you know, and well, the, but, like obvious shit like that. The one that gets me is uh, the next shot af- actually after they all leave and he's talking to his wife. Where oh it's, yeah, it's the two of them down the hallway, kind of you know framed with the the, the archway right there, and then yeah, and then and then Pesci right there, just sort of on the side of the scene, just kind of peering in, you know, almost like voyeuristically watching this this conversation. Right, and then he and, gets closer. I mean, he gets closer, and it's kind of and you're in the same shoes that uh, that Pesci's in right now. Where at first when the shot starts, you're just sort of like sitting there, sort of peeking around the corner almost, watching this fight happen. And then he gets a little bit more involved, and you kind of lean forward almost. And then we, you know, we cut to the next shot, or a little bit closer. You know, you're a little more invested in this argument right. as, as Pesci gets a little more invested in this argument. I think for me, the part that I found a little mo- the most eerie about this was that okay, it's shot in this wide way. You have you know the long depth of field, it's the Action's happening very deep in there. Yeah. But then you look at the mirror and it's just two yeah. guys stitching the meat, trying yep. to get their you know their stitching time up, and they don't flinch. They're yeah. just like, this is stuff that happens. And so then it creates a little another layer of paranoia where it's like, why is Joey getting involved? Is he doing anything? Now, did you think that he ever was doing something with his wife? Or did you ever have that no, inclination? I, no, I was the whole time I was like, man, this motherfucker is crazy. Okay, <laughs> so you thought you thought that he was crazy. <laughs> yeah. You knew he was crazy. Okay. No, because that's the thing. You you know, you have these impressively set up shots and you go, well, why would they cut off those guys? You know, why would they cut off? That's not the proper way to frame something, but you know what's happening. You know where it's happening in the room and you say visually, yeah, this is going crazy. And it does ask different questions at different times from different people of what their kind of expectations are set. You know, is Joe Pesci doing this thing? Is he, uh, is uh, Jake LaMotta in the wrong? Is his wife being scandalous because she doesn't want to order a cheeseburger? Like, what's going on, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it definitely just by having the, uh, including the mirror and just seeing kind of everybody else essentially going about their day like nothing's, nothing weird's going on, it just sort of adds to, especially with this scene, but it happens a lot, this very fly on the wall quality that they have with a lot of the shots where you're just watching life in this house play out. And for some of these people, you know, like Pesci, they get really, you know, invested and they're like, what the hell's going on? 
For other people, like the guys sitting in the back, you know, you stitch and meet, meet together. This is like a normal day for them. They probably did worse back with their wives and yeah. shit because they're a lot old. These guys are a lot older. Yeah. And, and when you first see De Niro in this movie, he's supposed to be 19, even though he looks like a grown ass man. Really? Yeah, no, that's the thing. <laughs> that's what I had to look up. Just like in the beginning of the movie, he's yeah. 19 dating a 15 year old. I was like, damn, she's 15. What? What is he like 35? But no, he in the movie in 1941, when he first starts boxing, he is 19 years old, maybe 20 at the oldest. Yeah. And so the five year difference is not so bad, but. But right. it yeah. is kind of crazy. Because I remember them mentioning that line about how she's 15, and they never mentioned that again. I was like, that was a weird thing. Are they talking about her? Because she yeah. Doesn't, she definitely does not look 15. She doesn't look 15. Yeah. She is 15, at least yeah. in the... I think, and, I, and she was real young, too, as an actress. Really? I just want to say she was just 18, maybe. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Jake LaMotta, he's, he's a scoundrel, I'll tell you that, yeah. man. But... <laughs> With that, we could talk about how these kind of personal things are, are set up, and mm. you know. But the fun parts are, are the fights, yes. and you know, you know, you know. I I'm know. a sucker for long shots. Now, did you know about this one? Um, maybe. Oh, did you even maybe notice it when it happened? I'm talking I, I about might, the I, long I shot have. from I this have. movie. I don't know. Well, I don't know. There's a, there's a few. When I think of like long shots I'm, in this movie, there's a few. Of them I'm talking about of. the one though, the one that lasts a minute and a half, probably. Yes, and that's the one where he's walking out for the fight. For oh, his championship fuck. fight. oh my God, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, you know what? I'm going to let you talk about that because you know what? I've seen it. Yeah. When I saw it for the first time, that was one of the things we had to analyze. I was like, how? Yeah. How did they do this? And so you being the film guy that you are, you know what? I'm just going to play it. I'm going to play the minute and a half. YouTube, sorry, you're going to get the edited version. And I'm going to let you respond to how this looks and how they went about doing this amazing shot. That is some nice movie making right there. Ian, go ahead, man. Now, here's the thing: with a lot of like really long shots in movies, there's always that tightrope you gotta walk. You gotta you gotta walk. Where is this just being masturbatory and you're doing a long shot just to go like, eh, look at me, look at how long I can keep the camera rolling, right? Or does it actually serve a purpose for the story? And this is like the very definition of a long shot that serves a purpose for the story, where you start out and it's just you know three, four people, you know, in, the, in a back room getting ready for a fight. And, you know, you follow Jake out and you watch his whole ritual as he's getting ready for the fight. And you're right there in his shoes as you hear, the, you know, the crowd start to get louder and louder and louder and the energy start to build. And what starts off at the beginning of the shot is a very kind of passive, again, fly on the wall moment of you're just watching him train. By the end of the shot becomes this very, at least for me, this very like, energized, you know, exciting shot where you, you, you're you right there in Jake's shoes because you've watched the whole buildup of him from, you know, you know, no crowd, you know, nobody around him to now he's walking out, you know, hundreds of people, hundreds of people all, you know, cheering him on and ready for the fight and all that. And you see him in his zone and it just sort of like per perfectly encapsulates all the anticipation and the energy that goes right into a fight. Well, all I'm asking is, hold on, I have to ask at this point, how do they go from... Let's see, let's go right here. Sammy yeah, Gonzalez, yeah. Sammy ain't see shit, frame by frame analysis here. How do they go from, okay, we're going to follow him behind, and yeah. you know, everyone's good, everyone's great, and then, and we went through all these tunnels and all these tight spaces, and then we're just going to fly outwards. We're just going to fly outwards see, on I, a crane. I thought, see, I thought about that. How the hell? No, 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 I don't think that's a crane at the very end, because... You, you think a tall guy just holding the camera Well, up? no, 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 I, yeah, I think what it is, because if you watch the whole shot, it's very, very clearly a, a handheld a handheld shot, you know, right. just the operator, you know, walking in front of them as they go down the hallway, and I think at the very end there, because at first I was like, did they do a crane? And I'm like, no, they, they couldn't have fit a fucking techno crane in that hallway. Right. I think it's literally just the operator, like you know, stepping onto a ladder or a table or something like that. Because if you watch it, there is a little bit of a wobble as it kind of steps up and, you know, kind of positions, the operator kind of positions, positions a shot. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it is just like a really adept camera operator, just, you know, essentially, whether it be a yeah, ladder, like a stepping stool or something like that, just like, you know, walking onto a higher platform right. to get the rest of the shot. And that's what makes this awesome because in that moment, for me at least, it's like you don't want to be this guy. But in that moment, you, you do. You are that guy. You, 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 you want, are that you, guy in that moment. And right. that's, it goes back to what I was talking about last week about, you know, uh, movies being empathy machines. Right. You know, and how you can do that with people who you, you wouldn't normally empathize with. Like like this fucking guy, you know? <laughs> like, you know this, like this asshole well, no, right normally, here. Normally, you'd be like, this guy's a piece of shit. Like, why would, I, why would I care anything for him? But stuff like that, 
you know, that is is like pure cinema, as it were, where it's 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 taking you out of your ordinary life, out of the things that you know and you've experienced, and putting you in the shoes, in the story, in the reality of somebody else, right? And making you feel what they're feeling, and that shot is a perfect example of that, right? And so, I mean. It gets me hyped, right? It gets me right? hyped. It gets yeah, you hyped. Right? And, you know, and what happens is in the last fight of this movie, you know, you don't want to be this guy. And that's the difference. When you when you go from the intro of that and he wins the championship, he's on top of the world. He's got the belt on. He's looking like a king. He's, yeah. He's on top of the world. Then he asks his brother if he fucks his wife. But no, but at that moment, he's on top. But that last fight, that last fight with Sugar Ray Robinson, he gets decimated. They call it the Val- St. Valentine's Day Massacre because he got wailed on. And we don't yeah. really know why. Maybe I think it might have been, like I said, all his life coming, getting to him and a lot of distractions yeah. at the end of his career, thinking, you know, I'm on my way out. Well, why was, do I want to keep losing weight and cutting weight? Well, not, yeah, and also Pe- uh, Pesci points it out in the scene right before that where he's like, dude, you keep eating and eating and eating like you're a fucking fighter. Yeah, and that was why he ballooned. So he just fucking like eating. And yeah. who doesn't at a certain point? But, you know, Scorsese, he took a lot from when he actually saw a couple fights. This is a guy who hates boxing, who hates sports. He went and saw a couple fights and he took away a few things that he saw a bloody rope, a uh, bloody sponge being used. Yeah. And he put that in this final fight. And it's really specific to add to this film, but Scorsese used a technique. And, a, and a, a certain element from a horror film, a classic horror film mm-hmm. in this final scene. Now, there's a lot of technical tricks in this, in the fighting scenes and in this scene in particular. But this one, I was like, you know what? This guy is an absolute master. This guy is the fucking best at this type of stuff because he put everything together so... Not, I would say masterfully. I always use that word. Mm-hmm. But he put it together in a way where that was so thoughtful and so intentional where it's like, you know what? Everything you wanted to get out of this scene, you absolutely got it. Now, there is a lot of things in this scene to notice. There's a lot of things. Yeah. First and foremost, I forgot to bring up, I didn't bring up, that these are all original recordings of oh, the really? fights. So okay. Scorsese goes, yeah. you know what? And no actor can simulate the kind of action, the kind of pacing of the way they talk and things. Yeah. So he got the actual, the best recordings he could and put them into the film. So that adds another layer of authenticity, the grain and everything to that. Well, that's the thing is that whole scene right there is like, you know, all these different aspects of the filmmaking process all coming together at once. It's like this this nexus point for, you know, yeah, like the, the set design, the art direction, you know, mm-hmm. in the sense of making the ring physically smaller. You know, you've also got like right here where they're using, you know, these telephoto lenses, you know, to help give you that weird kind of distorted look that you haven't gotten in the whole rest of the movie up to that point. Because the whole rest of the movie, you know, very deep, de- you know, uh, depth of field, you know, very kind of like, you know, uh, short focal length. You know, those shots, you know, very, very long telephoto lenses, you know, dropping, dropping the sound out. And then when the sound does come back in, you know, even stuff like when the photos go off. Yeah. You know, there's this almost like, you know, knife like quality to, to any time like the flashes go off or it's, you know, stabbing you almost, you know. Right. And then, the, you know, the editing, you know, it, it's slowing down and then rapid fire right there. You know, all the smoke with the cinematography, you know, the spotlights, it's all these different things, all these different little details all coming together at once to give you that that same feeling of like he's fucked <laughs> right <laughs> you know? and and even the sound the sound editor too just credit oh, to yeah, him yes, yes. the sound design of this is amazing yeah the sound design yeah. they use gunshots for the uh for the camera yeah. flashes and then they use uh smashing melons to get the to the body impacts mm. and what fucking clever dude he destroyed the uh, the audio files for the the smacking of the of the melons on the body, essentially of their fist, so that nobody could ever use them again. So heard about that, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah I mean, no, no sound, no, psh, no, psh, the, you know, these sounds are you're only going to hear them here. Mm. Someone will recreate them, but who knows, right? Mm. But I did mention, like I said, this stole from a classic horror movie. What element did you think they take uh, took from? Actually, I'll give you a hint. They took the shot list from it. They took the shot list from this movie. And applied it to the last fight scene, that barrage where he happens, where, that, where he's getting, you know, absolutely Is torn to pieces. Psycho shower scene. Uh, let's see. Yep. 
talk about fucking audio fucking ah yeah, man. there's no there's no cuts in that scene he's over but that that noise that sound effect god i hate that shit so much man it, it really does bother me <laughs> it gives me the jubilees but yeah he took the shot list from the, the shower scene and applied it to that last like barrage so you see like you know the close up bam this 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 cut fist you know it's the same pattern same rhythm and i go man that's not that's, you can't you can do that, but it's not fair because he's thinking he's thinking outside of a box I didn't even know existed. Yeah, that's so, what happens when you get a fucking like film nerd like Scorsese making a movie, man. Right, stuff like that. And then, and lastly, I, I do need to bring this up. Like, we are not running long, but we are kind of watch, showing a lot of clips. But it's because it's so visually stunning. Yeah. But there was really one time where the cinematography was the only thing on display. And hey, everybody, it's our favorite time again. And what time is that? <laughs> YouTube comments. YouTube comments section time. Hey, everybody. Welcome again to the show. If you like Sammy Ain't Seen Shit, if you like what we just saw, what was a Raging Bull? Raging we just Bull. did Raging Bull. If you like that, go ahead and like it down below. Hit it again and then hit it again. Three times a like, three times fun. Only counts once, but I like it when you do it three times. Also, leave a comment down there because guess what? Every week we read them in. We read those comments like we're going to do right now. So starting first. The number one comment, as we always like to read, you know that's going to be a thing. Number one comment, good, bad, ugly. Number one comment right. of last week, which was "Requiem for a Dream," the most horrifying. Ass to ass. Well, it's funny you say that because the number one comment is ass to ass. Daniel two two four N L ass to ass. There were so many ass to ass references in this Hells entire yes. comment section, but you know what? It's okay. I'm all right with it. It's iconic, I guess, from that movie. Sorry, say that one more time. The ass to ass scene is iconic, I oh, can say, from this movie. I thought you said ass to ass is like Hanukkah from that movie. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. Ass to ass Shalom. is like. Hallelujah. That's the wrong religion. <laughs> Next up, we have. Hello, We have Loopy Kick. Right. And this one was a deep cut. You you got called a lot of different names early on. The uh, was it a, not a toothpick with glasses, but a Q-tip, Q-tip with sunglasses. And you know what? I got called something a little more different. Let's see if you see it. Sammy looks like Fat Sanjay Desai from the show The oh, Strain. Shit. And I had to look that up, and I go, let me take a look. And uh, one, you don't have to say fat; that hurts my feelings. But two, that's him. And so let me see if I can go ahead and... Yeah. Uh, am I on the right side? Yeah, I am on the right side. Let me just go ahead and... Yeah, it's that, fa- it's that facial hair. Me. Oh, right there. Right there. There. Does that, yeah. Do I look like him? Yeah. It's the facial hair, man. It's the facial hair? Yeah, I think it's the it's facial there, hair. The symmetrical cut you got on the beard. You there. got it. And the nose is similar. The yeah. hairline is, is a little bit nicer that than sinister mine. Looking but you know what? Eyes. Sinister looking uh, eyes. The charisma oh. of a serial killer. That's oh. still my favorite. <laughs> it's charisma. No, it was the charisma of a date rapist. Oh, of date. Get it right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> get it right. If you're going to insult me, get it right. That's right. God, That's right. It. That's right. Gosh dang That's it. Right. Um, this is uh, Sulkanum79, and they ask, mm. has Sammy seen Taxi Driver or Raging Bull? Hey, oh, you got your answer. There you go. Whole show dedicated to that question. Uh, next up, we have Matt Stryker. Matt Stryker says... I know a lot of people like to say this is a movie you can only watch once, but I've watched it multiple times because it's just so brilliant. He's talking about Requiem for a Dream. The score, the story, the performances, the editing, and the overall effect it has are all incredible. Ellen Burstyn was robbed of an Oscar. Uh, amen to that, brother yeah. and or sister. I want to say uh, brother because your name's Matt. Her last few scenes will haunt you forever. Yes, they will. And her diet pills were hardcore drugs. She was basically addicted to doctor prescribed meth. There you go. What was the last guy's name? Uh, There you go. Uh, Goddamn. Jesse Collins. There you go. Uh, Matt Stryker agrees with me once again. But yeah, dude, I... She was robbed. I, yeah. I say that once. I'll say that again. Yeah, she man. was absolutely robbed. Um, to our next point, a point I brought up during that show, which is if you watch Donnie Darko and this at the same time, George Burgos, liar. I watched both movies as teenagers and I turned out fine. Full on Bush. <laughs> so, Jorge, I should say, Jorge Burgos. Uh, proven, proven my point. There you go. Ruffles have ridges. Ruffles have ridges. Mason Buchko, as much as I love the main crew of DT, I really love you two guys on these retro reviews. Your knowledge of film and editing really adds a lot to the discussion. Hence why I absolutely love the review of Blue Velvet. You guys did. Also, I think you guys might enjoy an indie sci-fi film named Beyond the Black Rainbow. Have you heard of that, Ian? I have not heard of this. Well, maybe we shall check it out. Maybe not on the show. Probably never on the show. Let's be honest. (laughs) We're never going to do that on the show. 
But one, never say never, even though I just did. And two, no. I'll, I'll see if we can give it a look. We've got some extracurriculars to do. Mm. Um, this one, I just put the whole comment thread just to see what would happen. But we always talk about give your reviews. We always talk about speak your mind. Mm. Dick Fillmore, one of the oh, most overrated yeah. films in history. Pretentious as hell. Drug addiction is a daily hell for many that doesn't require arm amputation or anal shows. I want to say but, would it be a whole that would cool work if it did have more anal shows. Right. And then, you know, Diko, Ishija. they're going back and forth on it. I'm going to let you guys read that. Go ahead and screenshot and read it. But yeah, they go at it. And wow. that's the thing. We want to facilitate, facilitate, I want to say the word right. We want to facilitate discussion. Open a dialogue. Open a dialogue, if you will, on some of these films. So some people really love it. Some people, you're not the only one that thought it was pretentious. A lot of people agreed with that sentiment, too. Yeah. Um, I think this is probably my favorite comment. Uh, of the nights of the rest of the show. Ellie Miller, people's constrict from opioids, they don't dilate. Should he try hard fail three out of ten? <laughs> <laughs> Ellie, that's a great review. I appreciate it. <laughs> Internet nitpicking at its finest and one inaccuracy, three out of ten. Shitty try hard film. It's over. That's it. But you know what, Ian? Mm. Speaking of that's it. That's it for this show. Thank you out there for watching YouTube. Like I said, like and comment down below. Do all those things. Subscribe to doubletoes.com. There's the whole crew. On the other side, we got we got high scores. We got all sorts of cool things. We got movie review extravaganza. Gans, 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 Gans. We got what up, sons? We got weekly roasts and toasts. Highlights Sunday of all services. that. Sunday services. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We got all that down there. Go ahead and subscribe. DTMerch.com. PartyDT.com. Check out all those things. And remember, always stay toasty. Hit them with the fade out. Bam. I'm gone. God, Jake Lamotta would be proud. But hey, give me your best boxing show. Give me, give me some, give me some punches, Ian. <laughs>